Today, we will be talking about carbohydrates. So, Gizmo, the baby gremlin, was hungry today. So I took him out to get some Krispy Kremes and we both got some raspberry filled jelly donuts, which are our favorite, okay? And Gizmo wondered, you know, why are carbohydrates so important? You can tell that he's wondering this because there's a lot of carbohydrates within this donut, right? So this donut has sugar and bread, it has the uh, syrup and the jelly, so it's just filled with uh, carbs, okay? But why are carbs so important in our world? Well, carbohydrates are actually, well, they can be used as an energy source, okay? So carbohydrates, we're going to call that carbs, okay? So carbs uh, can be used, can be used as an energy source, okay? It can be used as an energy source. So let's say that you're running a marathon and the, the people, the attendants, uh, you know, the people who give out water, well, instead of giving out water to you when you're running, they're giving you um, chocolate syrup or Pedialyte or something uh, because those have carbohydrates and you want to use your carbohydrates as fuel. Your body chooses carbohydrates as the first line of fuel because it's so easy to break down. It's so easy and plentiful that it will use that to do reactions, okay? So we use carbohydrates as a first source of energy. Uh, we can use it as uh, storage, okay? So we can use, uh, for instance, uh, starch products, right? So you're trying to bake something, uh, you have cornstarch. Cornstarch actually has a ton, a ton of carbohydrates in it, okay? Because starch molecules specifically are storage units for plants and other organisms. So we could use that as uh, storage, we can use that as a carbon source. Uh, for instance, pyruvate, which is a common product in the um, glycolysis cycle. Um, you can use some of the carbons from pyruvate to create amino acids, right? Because uh, pyruvate is going to be oxidized, it's going to be broken down, and some of the carbons that are snipped away from pyruvate can be used to form amino acids, they can be used to form other molecules. So we can use carbohydrates in that reaction as a carbon source. We can also use it as structure, structure, and protection. So you may not know this, but insects uh, their exoskeletons, so the out, the the hard outer portion of their body, they're actually made of carbohydrates. Okay, specifically, a a weird form of glucose. Um, we'll get into that, but imagine that insects are covered in sugar, right? So that's kind of weird, but we're gonna cover that later uh, because that sugar that they're made of, even though it's glucose, you can't eat it. You cannot eat it. Okay. Um, so used for protection, and carbohydrates can be used as recognition, uh, recognition, right? So recognition, cognition, right? And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about glycoproteins. So glycoproteins are the reason why we have different blood types, right? So the little um, red blood cells, depending on if they have, let's say, spikes on them, well, if your body is not used to having spikes on the red blood cells, it's going to sense that blood as an intruder, as a type of bacteria, and it's going to send uh, white blood cells to attack it because your blood, let's say in this example, has um, triangles on it. So triangles are different from spikes. Okay, so because of carbohydrates, we have different blood types. We have you know, a chart of whether you can donate blood or not to this group of people. Of course, uh, we'll cover that later. It's also used in uh, signaling carbohydrates. Carbohydrates uh, use signaling right there. So signaling just kind of, it does the same thing as recognition, right? So your antibody signal something is weird. It doesn't have the right um, carbohydrates attached to the molecule. So they're gonna attack it, right? Oh, uh, and another one is that carbohydrates can actually um, they can also be attached to other macromolecules. So can be attached to macromolecules.
That means that we can have glucose attach itself to proteins, it can attach itself to lipids. An example of this would have to be the blood types, okay? So your blood, your red blood cell is a protein, and when glucose attaches itself to that protein, it changes, you know, the blood type, right? So that's why we have A type, B type, etc. Uh, so you can tell that carbohydrates are really, really important in biochemistry. They're so important that our body actually makes carbohydrates by itself. Okay, we actually make uh, sugars in our body. So if you were to live in the mountains by yourself, okay, and you didn't have any sugar, no foods that contain carbohydrates, you would be okay because your body sees carbohydrates as something that is so important that it makes it itself, all right? That's how important carbohydrates are. So if you're asked on the exam or uh, medical exam, you know, does the body produce its own sugars? You say, yes, the body does produce its own sugars. So it says that body uh, produces its uh, own sugars, which is pretty, pretty cool because we don't make our own proteins, but we do make our own sugars. Okay, so whenever Gizmo is eating this uh, jelly-filled donut, he's actually feeding his blood, he's feeding his reactions, and he's uh, creating a, a carbon source for some metabolic pathways. So yes, that donut is very important to his life. Now we will talk about the different types of carbohydrates. So of course we're going to have our basic car uh, carbohydrates, meaning our simplest ones. We have the monosaccharides. So we have our monosaccharides. If we have something that's mono, we're gonna have something that's di. So we also have disaccharides as well. And if we have something that is di, we also have something that is tri. So we have trisaccharides, okay? Now, if we have uh, trisaccharides, and when we add uh, one more sugar molecule, or in this case carbohydrate, the trisaccharide becomes a oligosaccharide, most commonly heard as a polysaccharide. Okay, so if you add one more, we have polysaccharide. Okay, Ooh, that was bad. So let's see, polysaccharide. Now, polysaccharides. They're kind of interesting because these are really your storage uh, carbohydrates, okay? So you're going to see that in uh, starches and other uh, compounds. You know, a good example of a polysaccharide would have to be cellulose. So you know cellulose is a, um, it's kind of like what makes the tree uh, very sturdy and rigid, right? So if you were to take a um, some bark off a tree, it would be completely made of cellulose. And cellulose is really just thousands and thousands of glucose molecules uh, bound together by oxygen atoms, okay? So these are storage. These are storage um, sugars, okay? And this one right here is your most simplest carbohydrate, okay? So whenever Gizmo is eating this donut, He's eating uh, disaccharides, okay? He's eating sucrose, which is a simple sugar. But his body is going to break down those sucrose molecules, and they're gonna break them down into glucose molecules because glucose is what your body uses to do reactions, okay? So these are uh, the most uh, simplest. These are the simplest, okay? And this is kind of like the connection of two monosaccharides. Okay, so this is mono uh, connected to another mono. Uh, specifically for sucrose, it is a glucose molecule connected to a glucose molecule. So you can see that right here, you can have glucose uh, connected with another glucose, and that is going to create sucrose. Okay. So an example of this would be that the monosaccharide is glucose, and the disaccharide would have to be sucrose. Usually for monosaccharides, they follow a very simple uh, molecular formula. Uh, which goes as follows. So we have the amount of carbons and we also have some water, right? Excuse me, so that's N. So N is just a random number, right? So for instance, glucose is gonna have C6, and then we also have H12O6, right? So we will have about six right here. So 
this would be C6, and this is H2O, so let's see, that would be also 6. So C6, H12O6, right? That is the most common uh, molecular formula for monosaccharides. So this formula does not apply to trisaccharides or disaccharides or polysaccharides. It just works for monosaccharides, all right? So if you're ever uh, wondering what is the molecular formula for monosaccharides, think about glucose, C6, H12O6, okay? So six times two is 12, six oxygens right there, uh, 12 hydrogens, and then six carbons. And this brings up another key point that I want you to know, is that whenever two monosaccharides join together, they actually release water. So join uh, two monosaccharides, we're just gonna call that mono uh, sac. Okay, so join two monosaccharides um, gives water. Okay, and so you can tell that this right here is a dehydration reaction. So this is a dehydration reaction. Right. So to recap, whenever you join glucose molecules or any sugars together, they expel water, and that is called a dehydration reaction. Speaking of monosaccharides, it's important to know that monosaccharides exist as um, aldehydes and ketones. Okay, so monosaccharides, monosaccharides can be um, either aldehydes or ketones. Okay, that's the only functional groups that you're going to find in a monosaccharide. And we can actually kind of name these uh, these compounds, okay? So for instance, depending on the amount of carbons you have in a monosaccharide, you can tell the abbreviations or the prefixes, I mean. So for instance, you can have a triose, right? So you can have a triose. So tri means that there are three carbons, and ose means that we're dealing with a, a glucose molecule, okay? So usually ose is the suffix for sugars. So using that logic, it's pretty simple. We can say that if a, um, if a carbohydrate has four carbons, we can call that a tetrose. So let's see tetrose right here. And we have pentose and we have the hexose. Okay, very, very simple. Okay, so it's not too bad If you want a good example, this one right here is glycealdehyde. It's the most simplest um, carbohydrate, okay? So you may not think about it, but it's like, oh, you know, this is a carbohydrate. It looks weird, but it, it functions as a carbohydrate because what? We have a aldehyde right here. So this is gonna be the aldehyde, aldehyde right here. And how many carbons does this have? It has three carbons, we have one, uh, two and three. So we can say that this is a tri, right? So that's tri. Now there is an aldehyde, okay? So we have tri aldose. Ald, so for uh, aldehyde, and then ose for the glucose, okay? Or excuse me, for the carbohydrate. So putting it all together, the glyceraldehyde has three carbons, so we put tri. Now there is an aldehyde, so we put ald. And then it is a carbohydrate, so we put ose. Together that makes trialdose, okay? This one right here is not uh, important, okay, in this context, but it is the most simplest um, ketose that you can make. So this is the most simplest ketose. Okay, and you can tell that it is a ketone right here. And this one right here is called dihydroxyacetone. So, not very fun to say, but just recognize that this is a, uh, excuse me, this, this is a carbohydrate molecule, okay? It has a ketone, so that is a ketose. This has an aldehyde, therefore it is an aldose. And of course, we're gonna get into it more in detail. There is something very important, however, and is that 
monosaccharides, almost all monosaccharides have chiral centers. Let's write it over here. So almost, almost all monosaccharides have chiral centers. Okay. Usually it's just one chiral center, but the exception, as there are always ex exceptions to the rules, would have to be dihydroxyacetone, okay? Um, except uh, for dihydroxyacetone. And this makes sense, right? So this carbon right here is uh, double bonded to an oxygen, so that counts as two connections towards the same thing, in this case oxygen. It's not good, okay? So automatically, that chiral carbon is out of the picture. Um, we also have this carbon right here that has two hydrogens, and then this guy right here, which has two hydrogens, and that makes it not chiral, okay? But what about this guy? Uh, well, this carbon right here is bound to a alcohol, so that's good. And then it's bound to a hydrogen, which is different. And it also has another carbon, but that carbon is double bonded to this oxygen. So that makes it different. Now, if we go to his right side, this carbon is bound to an alcohol. So clearly, the right circle is different from the left, left circle, right? So these are two completely different carbon groups, okay? That makes it actually chiral. So to recap, um, almost all monosaccharides have at least one chiral center, all right? And the exception would have to be dihydroxyacetone. If you're asked to find how many chiral centers a molecule can have, just use a simple uh, formula where we have two raised to the n, and n is just the amount of chiral uh, centers, okay? So if a molecule has two chiral centers, then you would have two raised to the uh, to the second power, which is just four different possible configurations that a molecule can go. So this is glyceraldehyde, and glyceraldehyde, of course, is the most simplest monosaccharide that we can make. Uh, obviously, it has an aldehyde right here, so this is the aldose. And we have it uh, situated so that the aldose, or the aldehyde, is at the top, and you'll see why later on. Okay, but for now we can actually find out the serial chemistry of the uh, glyceraldehyde. So if we count this to be the chiral carbon, and it is, we can tell that this is going to be priority number one because this carbon is directly attached to this oxygen. Then priority number two is going to be this group because this carbon has more bonds to oxygen than this carbon. This carbon only has one bond to oxygen, so clearly this is going to have more of a priority. This is going to be the third priority, and this is the fourth priority, okay? So if we make a um, circle, we have that this is going to be left-handed. However, if we remember from organic chemistry, you know that the hydrogen is vertical, okay? So notice that hydrogen is uh, vertical and not horizontal, and therefore we can consider this to be um, the opposite. So if your lowest priority group, because sometimes it's not hydrogen, it could be a different atom. Uh, so if your lowest priority group is on a wedge, or if it's vertical, we just reverse what we wrote, okay? So we reverse the arrow. So therefore, this becomes right-handed. So this is right-handed, or you can call it D, okay? And the reason why glyceraldehyde is so important is because all the stereochemistry that we've been doing so far in our uh, chemistry careers are based directly on the configurations for glyceraldehyde. Okay, so R and L, or excuse me, R and S configurations are based upon glyceraldehyde. Okay, and so that kind of brings me to the notion of epimeres and anomeres. So what is an epimere? Okay, well, we obviously have enantiomeres and we also have diastereomers, right? So we have uh, diastereomers. But in that subsection of diastereomers, we have uh, epimeres right here. So we have epimeres. And epimeres, they're just essentially, um, so here's an example. There, there are two molecules, okay? Let's say that there are two glucose atoms, okay? 
and they have a lot of the same stereochemistry. However, in glucose B, one chirocarbon is different, okay? So you might have one molecule that is uh, left, uh, sorry, that is S configuration, and then the other glucose molecule is gonna be an R configuration. So it's a diastereomer, but it's only in one, literally one carbon, okay? So for instance, uh, let's just do a rough example. We have R, 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 uh, S, and then we have S, 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 R. Okay, so there we go. These right here are diastereomers. Okay, so notice that almost everything changed except a pair of, of uh, chirocarbons, okay? So it only has to be one chiro, um, sorry, it only has to be one carbon that changes. If there are two changes right here, so for instance, instead of S, I have another R, well, yes, they're still diastereomers, but it's not an epimer, okay? It's just one carbon. So you can consider epi to be the last one, right? So it's the, the best one that never changes, right? So epimer is just one carbon that changes. Overall, it's a diastereomer, but it's just one carbon that makes it a diastereomer. But what is an anomere? So an anomere, and let's write it over here in, uh, let's say, purple. So an anomere is actually an epimere, but is more specific. See, epimeres, it can occur in different molecules. You can have it in proteins, you can have it in lipids, but anomeres only occur in carbohydrates. So anomeres only occur in carbohydrates. Right? Why is that? Well, the car the one carbon that changes, okay, occurs at the ketone or the aldehyde. And in sugars, we call that the ketose or the aldose. And see, we can call that the uh, anomeric carbon. So it's, that's the carbon that does the changing. So anomeric, anomeric uh, carbon. Let's uh, write it here. Carbon uh, occurs at aldose or ketose. Okay, so yeah. So to recap, epimeres, well, they can occur in different molecules. They can happen in proteins, lipids, etc. And essentially, you take two molecules, you make them diastereomers, but you only change one carbon. Okay, so that is the one carbon that doesn't change. Now, for anomeres, they are also epimeres, but they only occur in carbohydrates, okay? And that actually, um, the flipping of the signs, so it's switching from S to R, occurs at the anomeric carbon, and that carbon is just an aldose or a ketose. Now we will be talking about Fischer projections. So we've already worked, uh, well, most of us have worked with Fischer projections, or at least uh, have witnessed the glory of <laughs> Fischer projections. But essentially, this is what it is, right? Um, so there was a researcher um, who was named Fischer, and he actually made this way of viewing molecules, okay? These are called Fischer projections, and these are his creations. And he did this because he was researching sugars, and he wanted to find kind of like a standard way to view them. Because depending on where you look at the sugar, you would say, oh, this is left-handed. No, this is right-handed. Oh, this is a priority group. No, it's this one. You know, so he was going to cut the, um, the ambiguity and just make a kind of streamlined way. And he said, he said, well, um, the carbons are going to be numbered from top to bottom, okay? So we're going to call this carbon number one, we're going to call this carbon number two, and carbon number three, okay? From top to bottom. And the carbons with the most bonds to oxygen are going to be at the top. So notice that our aldehyde, or aldose in this case, is at the top, okay? And typically, this whole chunk is very common, super supremely common, within sugars. So that chunk right there is going to be at the bottom. This is always at the bottom, okay? So this is always, always at the bottom. And this is more applicable if you're uh, a 3D person, a physical person, and you want to make structures of sugars with your uh, little baby model kit. 
Um, so if you're doing this with a model kit, you're always going to make this little chunk uh, at the bottom of it. Okay. So uh, now that we have that, um, we're going to dictate that the last chiral carbon of the structure is going to dictate the overall chirality of the molecule. So what am I trying to say? Well, imagine that we have a different mo uh, molecule that we're working with, okay? So imagine that you have a molecule that is uh, 36,000 um, <laughs> uh, carbons long, okay? Well, instead of trying to find each chiral center individually, just go to the uh, last carbon that is right here. So the carbon that's next to this little chunk, and you're just gonna base the overall chirality to that carbon. So it doesn't matter if you have S's and R's and S and R's, whatever. If this carbon right here is an R, then the overall molecule is going to be considered an R group or R configuration, excuse me. So in this case, this would be an R. So this is a D isomer, also known as right-handed. Um, so now we're going to be talking about these wedges and uh, hashes. Whatever is vertical will be a wedge. So right here, we have wedges that go like that, okay? And whatever is um, vertical, or yes, vertical, that's going to be what? That's going to be uh, hashes. So these are going into the page, and my hydrogen and hydroxide group are gonna be out of the page. They're gonna be facing towards me, right? Or out of the screen in this case. So that's kind of the general gist of Fisher projections. And now you know why we use Fisher projections uh, to research carbohydrates. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that uh, for aldose sugars, for aldose, so here's a uh, pro tip. Aldose sugars, aldose, typically have um, hydroxide groups on the right hand. And whenever that happens, whenever it's on the right, we call those uh, D, okay? So we call those D isomers. So D, or you can call it right, right-handed. If it's on the left side, then it obviously is going to be what? It's going to be an L isomer or left-handed, or you can consider it as an S. Uh, so left, left hydroxide uh, equals uh, L, or you can call it uh, S configuration. So the most common sugars that you're gonna encounter in biochemistry are actually right-handed. So they have um, an R configuration or they're D isomers. Uh, for this class, we're gonna be calling them D and L, okay? So I'm gonna stop using R and S. Uh, so the most common ones that you're gonna find are gonna be called uh, D glucose. We also have D uh, mannose. Let me just fix that. And we also have D galactose. I wouldn't recommend uh, memorizing the different uh, molecules to different names because really they're just a mess to, to think about. So for instance, depending on, well, you can have two molecules that look almost the same, but one molecule has the hydroxyl group on the right side, one molecule has a hydroxyl group on the left side, and that's a completely different sugar. And so trying to figure out, oh, this is glucose, this is galactose, it's really a hassle. I don't recommend doing that. Um, of course, this differs for every class, but I doubt that it would be um, mandatory in this course. I, I doubt it. And before I move on to the next slide, I just want to piggyback off of this idea, right? and this idea as well. There are about 15 molecules, or I should say carbohydrates or sugars, that are D, right, that are right-handed. But notice that all of those molecules are gonna have the hydroxyl group on the right-hand side, okay? So on the chiral carbon, all the um, sugars that are D isomers are gonna have the alcohol on the right hand. So that could be a good exam question, you know? Um, for simple monosaccharide sugars, you know, what makes it a D isomer? Well, you can say that it is the addition of the hydroxyl group on the right-hand side of the chiral carbon. Okay. To really emphasize what I just said, notice that this carbon right here is going to 
uh, be the same as this carbon. So yes, this is a chiral carbon, right? And so we're going to dictate the overall molecules uh, stereochemistry by that carbon. And, but notice that the hydroxyl group is on the right-hand side of that chiral carbon. That makes it uh, D, right? So this is a D isomer and this is also a D isomer. But uh, look, so we have hydrogen, hydroxide, hydrogen, hydrogen. Over here we have hydrogen, hydroxide, and look right there, hydroxide, hydrogen. So literally only one carbon changed. So we can call these enantiomers, or excuse me, we could call these uh, diastereomers, right? So both of these are diastereomers. So we're just going to call that diastereomers. But what kind of diastereomers are they? These are a subsection of epimers, right? So only one carbon changed. And that is what makes it a diastereomer. Okay, so you can say that D-glucose is an epimer of D-galactose. You're probably saying, okay, Brian, what's the difference? I don't care. Well, your body does care because your body cannot process D-galactose as easily. It can take it in to its system, but then it's going to have to do a little bit more work to convert that uh, epimer into glucose because glucose is kind of like the simplest sugar that we can process naturally, right? So um, again, uh, depending on what change will have a different effect on the body. So for instance, uh, galactose would have to be processed again by the body to make D-glucose, uh, okay? So if you want to number it, we can say that this is uh, C1, this is C2, 3, 4, let's write it over here, this is C5, and that is C6. So glucose and galactose both have uh, six carbons, and you can say that D-glucose is an epimer of D-galactose at the C4 uh, carbon, okay? I just want to do a quick example with fructose, uh, specifically a ketose. So this is a ketose, right? Because we have a ketone um, over here, okay? And notice that everything changed from image A to image B, and that makes it an enantiomer, right? So there are no epimeres associated in, in this example, okay? Uh, nothing uh, didn't change, everything changed. So technically this is an enantiomer and this is a ketose because right here, that is a ketone. Okay. And here are some fun facts, some very fun facts about fructose. Uh, fructose is actually the sweetest sugar. Okay, so whenever we're talking about high fructose uh, corn uh, syrup, which I'll mention later, uh, this is what we're talking about. Okay, so that's why companies make products with high fructose corn uh, syrup because fructose is the sweetest sugar in the world, okay? Possibly even the universe. Think about that. We will now be talking about uh, cyclization of carbohydrates, okay? So we're going to be making cyclic uh, structures. And this is where all the spookiness and fun begins, okay? So um, you can uh, do some big boy reactions with this, all right? So right here, this is not typical in nature, okay? So it's nice on paper, but in real life, uh, carbohydrates are typically, uh, you know, cyclic structures. And this right here is a very simple glucose molecule, all right? If you were to join these together, you would have a uh, disaccharide. Specifically, you would have, I believe it is a uh, sucrose, right? So how do we get from here to there? Well, first of all, let's do a uh, typical reaction, okay? We're going to have R, which is just a random chain of, of carbons, uh, carbohydrate, uh, hydrogen, and uh, carbonyl, okay? Now, what if we add some alcohol? So the universe runs on alcohol, okay? Don't ever forget that. What happens here is that this uh, carbonyl is going to go towards the oxygen, making it more uh, electronegative. And this hydrogen is going to leave the oxygen and it's going to be taken up by this oxygen right here, okay? Uh, so now we have kind of like an intermediate of this guy, okay? And let us not forget the hydrogen. Now we have R prime O negative. And now this one is slightly positive, right? Um, Let's do that in a smaller circle. 
So that's slightly positive. This oxygen is going to attack this carbon. We will now have the following structure. We will have this. We have R, uh, carbon, and alcohol right here, uh, hydrogen, and then O, R, R prime. So essentially what you did was you connected an, uh, an oxygen that had a chain of carbons attached to it. You connected that oxygen to a carbon that had a chain of other carbons attached to it. How does that play into this uh, concept? Well, over here, you have a six-membered uh, structure, right? We have a, a, um, a carbohydrate. So we're going to call this carbon 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. What happens here is that on carbon 5, okay, sometimes you have a larger carbohydrate, but it is the chiral carbon okay, in general that its alcohol binds to either the ketose or the aldose. Okay, so this alcohol is going to attach itself via a hemicetal reaction. So this right here was a hemicetal, hemiacetal, hemiacetal uh, reaction. Uh, you can call it an addition. But essentially what happens here is that this carbonyl is going to go towards the oxygen. This uh, hydrogen leaves the alcohol. It is picked up by this oxygen right here. And then this oxygen is going to bind itself to this carbon. That's what happens. And you will start seeing a, uh, a fusion of uh, bonds together and then you start becoming cyclic. So that's what you're seeing over here. So again, this is carbon one, uh, two, three, four, and five. And there's also carbon six. So notice that over here, carbon five, right? Carbon five is uh, kind of moving itself towards the aldehyde, kind of like Jaws from the movie. So it's kind of stalking its prey. It's getting ready to shoot off a hydrogen and snatch up a, a carbon from the aldehyde. And notice that that's what happens right here. This, um, this hydrogen is going to be picked up by this oxygen. And then this carbon, or excuse me, this oxygen is going to bound, bind itself to that carbon. Okay, so that is a, a hemicetal reaction. Now notice uh, you have this really cute structure now. All right? And I will now be introducing alpha anomers and beta anomers. So now we have anomers. Remember what anomers were. Anomers are actually the uh, diastereomers, but specifically for carbohydrates and specifically for the aldose or ketose. So uh, this is aldose or ketose. And you're probably wondering, hey, Brian, I, I don't see an aldehyde anymore. I don't see a ketone anymore. How does that make it an anomer? Well, it's an anomer because this guy right here, this guy right here was born. It was birthed. It was brought into this world without its will. It was forced upon us from a ketone or from an aldehyde. Specifically, this guy right here came from an aldehyde. And so we can call this an aldose carbon. We can call this an aldose aldose carbon, okay? Um, this right here is also an aldose carbon. Cool. Now, if this came from a ketone, so let's imagine that this is not an aldehyde, instead it was a ketone, we would call that the ketose carbon. We would call that uh, the anomeric ketose car uh, carbon. But in this example, it is an aldose. Now, why is that important? It's important because you have the alpha anomer and you also have the beta anomer. What's the difference? The alpha anomer and the beta anomer are different in the position of the oxygen, or, or excuse me, of the hydroxyl group. So notice that the beta anomer is going to have its hydroxyl group on the top. And the alpha anomer is going to have its hydroxyl group on the bottom. So notice that this is uh, bottom, and this is going to be top, right? So an easy way to remember this is to say, okay, well, beta, get up for breakfast. Okay, so there we go. And why did we mention breakfast? 
Well, typically carbohydrates are associated with food, and food is usually in breakfast. But the reason why atomers are so important, specifically alpha and beta atomers, is because depending on which configuration you're in, you will not be able to digest that food. What am I trying to say? Well, okay, look at the shirt that you're wearing, okay? Let's pretend that it's 100% pure cotton. Well, what you may not know is that cotton is actually 100% sugar. So if you're wearing a 100% cotton shirt, you're wearing a shirt that is made of pure sugar. Why then, I ask you, can you not take off your shirt and you know have it for breakfast or lunch or brunch or whatever? Well, the main reason is because it would look weird um, against our society norms. You can't do that. Um, but the real reason is because uh, cotton is made from beta atomers. So in the cotton molecule, if you we, if we were to zoom in on a molecular level, the uh, sugar molecules are combined, they're attached uh, via glycosidic bonds, and, and they are beta atomers, okay? And our body cannot function, they, it cannot uh, break down beta atomers. Instead, the sugars that is within uh, syrup, donuts, Cheetos, those are attached in alpha atomers, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, your body can't eat beta atomers, but you know what can eat beta atomers? Uh, you can have... Um, kind of like these enzymes in your body, well specifically animals' bodies, that are primed to eat beta atomers. For instance, termites have this enzyme which uh, break down beta atomer bonds. Uh, beavers which eat wood also have that bacteria or enzyme. And cows actually have bacteria in their gut that chews down the beta atomers within the fibers that they eat. So for instance, they're eating a bush, that bush has beta atomers in it. and that is why we can't eat the same type of food that cows eat for the most part, okay? Uh, the exception to this, however, is that we produce a bacteria, most of us do anyways, uh, called lactase, and lactase actually breaks down the beta atomers within the lactose molecule, okay? So lactose is one of the few sugars that is bound by beta atomer glycosidic bonds, okay? And normally we couldn't be able to process that, but our body actually produces uh, bacteria that can break down that uh, bond, okay? But sometimes you can't produce that enzyme. Let's say that you're lactose intolerant. That's where it comes from. So what happens now is that the body tries to kind of degrade that molecule, and it produces a lot of uh, methane gas, a lot of um, irritable, irritable bowel uh, syndrome and whatnot. And so you have a lot of a um, intestinal pain if you do not have the lactase enzyme, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is that the beta atomer, that's a really weird beta. So uh, beta atomer uh, can't be digested, be digested by humans. And so Another concept that I can introduce is that uh, cellulose, which is often found in plant material, it's found in tree uh, bark, we can't eat that because cellulose and other plant material are made from beta atomers, okay? So it can't be digested by humans. Uh, alpha atomers, however, can be digested. And so that would include like starches and potatoes and other plant material that includes um, alpha atomers. Before I forget to tell you, this whole reaction, it is a hemiacetyl hemi reaction, but specifically uh, some textbooks, recall, um, they refer to this as a uh, aldol con condensation. So this right here is an aldol, aldol condensation. Okay. So if you're asked, oh, what is an aldol co condensation, you just say, oh, well, it's just a hemiacetyl reaction, and it binds the last chiral carbon onto the either the uh, ketone or the aldehyde. But specifically for the aldol co co um, excuse me, condensation, you're going to be binding it to the aldehyde functional group. Okay, pretty simple. We will now be talking about the conversion between um, Fisher projections and Howarth projections.
Okay, so this is a Howarth right here. So Howarth. And it's essentially a carbohydrate that doesn't show the carbons, okay? The only carbons that it explicitly shows is this guy right here, okay? So that's kind of like this chunk. Uh, specifically, we're working with glucose, so I'll be focusing on the left-hand side. And what you want to do is that to convert this guy into a Howarth projection, you just have to know the position of where the alcohol is at, okay? And you have to know which carbons you're working with. So what I like to do is, I like to number my carbons first. So I go one, uh, two, three, this is gonna be four, and five, and then six. And then I know that this right here, which is the anomeric carbon, specifically the aldose carbon, I know that this is gonna be the first one. So this is one, uh, this is gonna be second, third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to my first carbon Oh, and I'm gonna say, well, the second carbon in this case, I'm gonna say, well, this alcohol is towards the right-hand side, okay? And here's a mnemonic that we can use uh, when we see that. So if you think using excessive alcohol is right, then your life will be going down, right? It's gonna bring you down. So if the alcohol is on the right-hand side, it will be pointing downwards in the Howarth projection. Okay, so alcohol, so OH, right, equals down, right? Excessive use of alcohol, if you think it's right, it will bring your life down, right? Don't be an alcoholic, that's bad. So OH uh, towards right is down in Howarth. Howarth, okay? So notice they, that on the first carbon right here, you're probably wondering, well, where's the hydrogen, or excuse me, where's the alcohol on this one? Well, technically this is the right-hand side and we're converting this carbonyl to an alcohol, so it should be pointing upwards, and indeed, that is upwards. Is this an, uh, is this an alpha or beta? Well, this is a beta configuration, so you can say that this is beta glucose, right? Um, now on the second one, the alcohol is towards the right again, so technically, the second one is pointing downwards. Okay, so that's pretty common. The third one, let's see, this third one is on the left-hand side, and that is going to be pointing upwards right here. Right here on the fourth carbon, we have that the alcohol is pointing towards the right, so the alcohol should be pointing downwards. Now the fifth one is kind of weird, but notice that the alcohol uh, was converted in a hemiacetyl reaction, also known as a aldose condensation in this case, it was pointing towards the right. That means that this one right here should have been pointing downwards, but you can't, you know, it's weird how um, this picture is formatted, but just know that typically that's the case. Um, so yeah, so the main trend that you should know here is that whenever you want to convert the Fisher projections into Howarth projections, you're going to make the alcohol, if you see it on the right hand side, you're going to say, well, that is going to go pointing downwards in the Howarth projection. Okay, so it's not, it's not that difficult. Um, another thing that is mandatory is that this uh, chunk right here, this chunk, that's always, always, always going to be pointing upwards. Okay, so this is always, always pointing upwards. You're probably wondering, well, if we can make a cyclic compound out of aldehydes, can we do the same thing for ketones? And the answer is yes. And we do that through a reaction uh, called a hemiketal reaction. So this is a hemiketal reaction. And it's the same thing as the hemiacetal reaction, okay? Except instead of this carbon having a hydrogen, we have another uh, R group. So we have another chain of carbons, right? Then we just do it as normal. So let's call this prime, and then we're gonna uh, call this R double prime, and then alcohol. So what happens here is that this carbonyl breaks off towards the oxygen, uh, this hydrogen leaves the oxygen, it is picked up by this oxygen, and then this oxygen attacks 
this carbon. And so overall, you should have R carbon, R prime. You have an alcohol right here. And then you also have an alcohol, well, excuse me, you have an oxygen with an R group, okay? So what does that look like in this term? Well, right here we have a six carbon ring and it is a ketone, so it's a ketose. We call that carbon two, uh, carbon three, carbon four, five, and six. And what happens here is that the fifth carbon, uh, C5, so in both reactions, uh, the hemiacetal and hemiketal reactions, it is a C5 carbon that does the attacking. And what it does now is that instead of attacking the first carbon, it's going to attack the second carbon. So essentially, always target the carbonyl. Right? So uh, right now we're getting, um, we're priming ourselves to become a cyclic compound, right? So this is what? This is the fifth carbon right here. So we have carbon one, uh, two, three, four, five, and this is gonna be six right here. So the fifth carbon is extending its alcoholic hand, its alcohol hand, towards the ketone, right? So now what's gonna happen is that this bond breaks this uh, carbonyl bond breaks as well. This oxygen is going to attach itself to that hydrogen. And now this is gonna make this oxygen more negative and it's going to attack the carbon right there, okay? So it's going to attack that carbon and it's going to make a cyclic compound, as you'll see. So let me just redraw that. There we go. So when that happens, we have two possible uh, confirmations. We have the alpha, which is the alcohol pointing downwards, and we also have the beta, which is the alcohol pointing upwards. But notice that on the, what is this, a ketose carbon, so on the atomeric ketose carbon, you will have two groups. You have the alcohol group, and then you also have this chunk that you have, right? So it's just a, another carbon. If we were to number it, we can number this as following. We can do this as carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, 4, 5, and then let's redo that. That was carbon 5, and this is carbon 6. So now the difference between a hemiacetal reaction and the hemiketal reaction is that in the hemiacetal reaction, the anomeric carbon, the one that can either be an alpha or beta, is at carbon 1. But the hemi Keto reaction has the um, the C2 carbon, the second carbon, that could be the anomeric carbon, okay? So hemiketal is just for ketones, and ketones, their anomeric carbon is carbon-2. And hemiacetal reactions, which is for al aldos, uh, excuse me, aldehyde um, sugars, they're going to have their anomeric carbon at the first carbon, okay? So that's really all there is for hemiketal. It's just the same thing as the hemiacetal reaction, except you're doing this for a ketone, right? And then your, uh, your anomeric carbon is gonna be on carbon two, right? So uh, that's all that I have for this video. I hope that this video helps you understand carbohydrates in more detail. Of course, there is going to be another part to this video, or to this chapter, because carbohydrates are a major macromolecule in your body, and there is a lot of information to cover. This is just the building blocks that helps you understand uh, what makes the sugar reducing, uh, how we can link them together, how we can break them, etc. So hopefully this helps you um, become better pre prepared for your exam. I hope that you have a great day, and thank you so much for spending your time with me. Of course, I love you, and I hope that you uh, stay safe. So have a great day, and thank you for watching.